Okay, uh, let's, let's get started. Welcome to the first uh, afternoon session. Uh, we'll start with a talk by Professor Lyndon Archer. So before he gives his talk on uh, electrolyte interfaces and interfaces and batteries, I'd like to introduce him. <coughs> so Professor Lyndon Archer is a James A. Friend Family Distinguished Professor in Engineering at Cornell and also found and board member of NOMS, a uh, uh, company developing uh, electrolytes for lithium ion batteries. So Lyndon Archer joined the uh, Cornell faculty in 2000, and he was appointed the uh, director of the uh, School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering uh, in 2010. And also he, uh, since 2008, uh, he has been served as co-director of House Cornell Center for Energy and Sustainability. And his research focuses on uh, transport properties of polymers and organic, organic hybrid materials. And also Professor Archer is also interested in uh, application of hybrid materials for energy storage and carbon uh, capture technologies. He earned his PhD degrees in chemical engineering from the University of uh, Southern California. PhD is uh, from uh, Stanford in 1993 and then he did a postdoc at uh, Bell Lab. Uh, and he has been recognized with numerous uh, awards, uh, which include uh, AIST uh, MAC uh, Centennial in uh, Engineer Award. And last year, he was elected to the uh, National Academy of Engineering. With that, let's welcome right, you. Thank you. Uh, all right, so first of all, thanks, Young, for the introduction. Jin, for organizing. And everyone who's made this event um, the success that it's been uh, so far. So I'm going to talk to you about what hopefully you didn't hear this morning. Uh, it's always tough to go after Jean-Marie because he covers everything so well. So, um, so even though I'm separated by lunch, I still feel the pressure, right? So, um, so I'm going to talk to you about um, lithium metal batteries, which I'm certain you didn't hear about this morning, um, for a variety of reasons. So first of all, I think you know the first lithium batteries were of this variety, where the anode of the battery actually used just lithium foil, the metal. The cathode in the earliest examples were intercalating materials. And these batteries are not in circulation today because of this little event, where the anode doesn't plate uniformly. It forms these structures that are mossy, depending on who you speak to, or dendritic. Um, if they're um, uh, more in the fluid mechanics community, and over time, the battery um, gets shorted. And as a consequence, um, these events are considered to be safety hazards, and lithium batteries are not um, in commercial practice uh, or commercial use today. So what got me interested in this question, and why I think you should be interested in this question, is that pretty much every battery that uses a metal electrode has the same problem that a lithium battery has. And in fact, until recently, we used to think that magnesium was special. There was some early work by Orbach that suggested that somehow magnesium escaped the dendrite problem that lithium and other, that's not true. There's since been quite a variety of studies that show that magnesium forms dendrites almost as readily as sodium and lithium. So it tells us that this is a generic and fundamental problem. And ironically, even the replacement um, anode, the lithium carbon X in, in my example here, forms dendrites and under conditions where technology is going. So under fast charging conditions, as you heard this morning, because of the very small potential difference that separates lithium intercalation in graphite versus plating, a lithium ion battery very quickly becomes a lithium metal battery. And as you know, for convenience, we want to basically do fast charging because many people believe this is the barrier towards broad-based acceptance of EVs um, in, in, in spite of the declining costs. So this is a big problem that I think um, is a sort of grand challenge question to the extent it's relevant for all metals. Now, I sort of got renewed um, excitement about this question um, based on this graphic that uh, Yetman at MIT um, uh, created in 2017. And I've actually added um, a few things to this graphic. And basically, the graphic considers this sort of holy grail question of how do we get to $100 per kilowatt hour in energy storage. And this is actually, I think, before 
many of the innovations that Elon Musk and others have implemented that has gotten us closer uh, to this target. And so the chart basically is a busy chart that shows a whole range of battery chemistries. And you can see many things, and, and in, in particular, several of the lithium ion technologies that are familiar, like carbon 6NC, are very close, at least from the materials cost perspective, to that $100 per kilowatt hour. But if you go down the chart and you look at what are the really cheap, inexpensive battery designs, you'll see that they all use a metal as the anode. Okay? And so this comes from two sources. It comes, A, from the higher energy density of the metal in the absence of an intercalating host, like the carbon in a lithium ion battery. But it also comes from the simplicity in terms of designing the battery. You just use a metal plate to, to engineer it. So this, to me, is, is, was a sort of marching order that um, someone or some number of people need to really get on this thing and hopefully um, provide innovative answers um, that could be ultimately uh, practiced. So, um, so the field has been busy, and this chart is deliberately busy, where people have been working essentially in three quadrants. So people have been proposing solutions that were once old and now new again, based on ceramics, the idea of making so-called solid state batteries, where the electrolyte or separator is strong enough that it prevents dendrites from penetrating um, between the electrodes. Um, I will show you a little bit of work that is done in my company. I was told I need to talk about GNOME's technologies uh, today, where we've actually used ionic liquids as um, basically additives, or functional ionic liquids, as, as GNOME's would say, as additives, to um, solve one of the problems um, with um, battery shorting associated with safety and fires. And I'll, I'll tell you about my passion. So I believe in polymers, and I believe that they're actually the answer to many of the issues that we're having today with solid state batteries, and I, I'll hopefully give you a little bit of a flavor for, um, for the work we do. So the, the talk is organized in two parts. In the first part, I want to talk about what are termed defensive strategies, which are strategies that say, well, you know, lithium has this tendency, it's a fundamental characteristic, it will form dendrites, what can we do to have it fail safe? In the second part of the talk, I want to use continuum mechanics, uh, theoretical work as a guide, to hopefully be more aggressive in terms of designing interfaces and electrolytes that can actually overcome this problem, at least in some, in some cases. So to begin, um, so that by far the most effective strategy so far in solving the lithium metal uh, battery problem uh, comes from the work of Nancy Dudney and co-workers um, at Oak Ridge National Labs. And basically what Nancy did is created an all solid state micro battery that has the configuration that I'm showing you here. So basically a lithium metal electrode that's roughly um, about 500 nanometers in size is uh, paired with um, a NMC uh, cathode, uh, not an NMC cathode, but the mangan lithium manganese oxide um, cathode. And this cell uses a lipon, which is a solid ceramic, as a separator. And again, the scale bar is 500 nanometers. And this was a deliberate design because what Nancy wanted to do is to create all of the electrodes and all of the components perfectly using sputtering methods. So basically the anode, the cathode, the electrolytes were made using either magnetron sputtering or chemical uh, vapor deposition. The end results are just exceptional, right? So these batteries have been cycling over 10,000 cycles at rates as high as 5C. And you can see that the capacity fade has been less than a percent over these cycling, these levels of cycling. The cathode is a five volt cathode. Um, what Nancy and her team did was also compare the performance of these batteries with conventional batteries with liquid electrolytes. And what they found is that as the amount of electrolyte in the cell increased, the liquid battery begins to approach the solid state battery, but never actually meets it in terms of the, the performance. So, so, so I like these results because they tell us that this can be done. Obviously, I don't like them because they tell us that they can only be done in very ideal situations where we use um, very thin materials for the anode, the cathode, that obviously would be impractical um, in, the, in the applications you heard about uh, this morning. Now, one of the main reasons why the length scales have to be so rigidly held is that the ceramic um, used as the electrolyte lipon is extremely poorly conductive. 
Uh, so I think many of you know, transport times goes like length squared divided by the transport coefficient. So if the length is small, the time scales can be small, which means that you can cycle the battery at reasonably high rates, even though the conductivity of the electrolyte is in, implicitly um, quite low. So everyone thought that, well, if we can find better lithium ion conducting solids, then this will solve the problem. And in fact, this morning you heard about some of the news out of Toyota that says, oh, well, we're going to do this in two years. And oftentimes what happens is material chemists, they come up with something that has one figure of merit right, like the, a good ionic conductivity, and then they go to the press, and then there are other important things like manufacturability and so on that get discovered later on. And this is no accident that recent results coming out of the group at Michigan indicates that even ceramics that have high conductivity and are hard, mechanically strong, are prone to form dendrites. In fact, the work of Sakamoto showed that the dendrites grow along the grain boundaries of the ceramic, shorting the cell much as they do in a liquid electrolyte, and subsequent work by Nancy Dudney showed that that characteristic emerged from the fact that the grain boundaries are actually electronically conducting. So it's essentially you have a current collector throughout where the electrolyte uh, should be. So this is a huge problem because these so-called LLZO chemistries were considered to be the most promising in terms of solid state batteries. But oddly, there's even older work, actually work done by Cornell, at Cornell in the 1970s, that shows an even more important problem from my perspective, and that has to do with processing of ceramics. So what these authors found is that in sodium batteries that basically use a hard sodium beta alumina as the electrolyte, that dendrites form, but whenever the dendrites form, they would observe a crack in the material. And so what it means is that even if you make a ceramic that's great, if it can't be manufactured within some number of sigmas, that there's always going to be a possibility that some number of cells in your system are going to fail by this mechanism. And I don't think enough people think about, about this characteristic of ceramics, that their brittleness puts manufacturing constraints that one has to be explicitly attentive to at the outset. So, um, so I'm a big fan of polymers. And in particular, a particular type of polymer that we call gnomes. And gnome stands for nanoscale organic hybrid materials. You heard a little while ago from Young that we had this center called the KAUST Center for Energy and Sustainability. And one of the big discoveries of that center was that you can actually take inorganic nanostructures, in this example, silica, that are a few nanometers in diameter, typically order 10 to 50, and you densely graft them with ligands. And these ligands are oligomers, and you'll see in a minute that's deliberate and important. So you densely graft them with oligomers, and these materials exist as what are called self-suspended suspensions, where the inorganic structure, the black dots in my example, is supported in a phase that is defined by the organic ligand that you tether to the particles. So these systems are intrinsically nanoporous because they create pore structure that is set by the length scale of the particles and the volume fraction of the particles, but you can internalize into the pore chemistry that you put on the surface of a nanoparticle. So it gives you the ability of not just creating a porous structure that with the right chemistry on the, on the corona could be a lithium ion conductor, but you can, make, you can mix and match the chemistry with polymers and ionic liquids to create materials that can regulate the flux of ions. And this we, we, we are really excited about. So, um, so Jennifer Schaefer, who's actually now a professor and long since graduated, um, discovered another really interesting and exciting feature of these materials. So typically, there's a trade-off between modulus and conductivity in all electrolytes. Usually, the stronger the material, the worse its ionic conductivity. And so what Jennifer discovered is that as you change the volume fraction of silica particles in these gnomes materials, there's a transition from a state where the materials are fluid-like to one where they're solid-like, where the modulus changes by several orders of magnitude, orders six or seven orders of magnitude but the conductivity changes by at most a factor of 10, indicating that somehow in these systems we were able to break the straight off between mechanics and ion transport. And as a polymers guy, it is obvious why. It is obvious why because the ligands are actually oligomers. And because they're oligomers, meaning their molecular weights are below 2,000, they don't crystallize. So the thermal transitions, the glass transition in particular, 
is actually defined by basically free volume that comes from the end groups. And there are 1,200 of them for every single hairy nanoparticle. So we have the ability to create these systems that had really nice conductivity and really great, um, really great mechanics. And of course, we wanted to understand, can they work in a lithium metal battery? And so the first experiments, I will, I will admit, they were completely blind. Okay? And we were inspired by work done by uh, Natash uh, Balsera that used dye block polymers that are made of polystyrene, po PEO. PEO is a good, again, ion conductor. Polystyrene is hard. These materials undergo what's called microphase separation. So at temperatures below the glass transition temperature of polystyrene, they essentially form an ordered structure of polystyrene glass that is very much like the structure I showed you before with silica nanoparticles that essentially mediate the, um, the, um, the, the polyethylene um, glycol block. So these things can be cylinders, um, they can be coexistent spheres, they can be lamella, depending on the relative concentration. So what Natash did was study these systems in lithium metal uh, cells, where he basically created a very simple sandwich cell, where you take lithium from one electrode, plate it at a constant current onto the other electrode, and then reverse it. And did that at constant current, and measured a voltage as a function of time. And what he observed is that at short times, meaning small amounts of capacity, past, you get this very nice following trend where the voltage basically follows the current. Okay? At a long enough time, it is observed that there's a very sudden drop in the voltage with, um, with cycling. And this drop, he showed, was actually associated with the dendrite shorting the cell, which essentially reduces the resistance. And so at constant current, the voltage becomes smaller. So this is a very simple experiment that allows you to define a figure of merit for any electrolyte that you can use to determine is it effective in stopping um, the dendritic um, growth and shorting of lithium cells. So, um, so Natash had the, the presence of mind to basically plot the reciprocal of this amount of charge pass. Remember, for an ideal battery, you want that number to be infinite. So it never shorts. So the reciprocal would be zero. So he plotted that as a function of the fraction of the polystyrene component. And at the time, he thought that the polystyrene component added mechanics, which is a reasonable thing to think. And so he plotted against the modulus of the overall material and found this very interesting inverse relationship, where it appears that the, um, so these are the data points, the orange circles, where it appears that you intersect zero at a value of the modulus that is actually very similar to what um, John Newman had predicted from solid mechanics analysis that says that in essence, the only way to stop the dendrites from shorting, even in a polymer, is if you're able to mechanically block the lithium by creating a, um, an electrolyte or membrane that is stronger than the lithium dendrites. Now along came this young lady, um, Yingying Lu, who didn't believe that, right? So she had this habit of doubting me. Every time I tell her X, she would say Y. And, um, and so she decided to study her hearing nanoparticles in exactly the same way and observe that you cross zero at a much lower modulus than the lithium metal. And so that was kind of exciting for us. The excitement came at the same time we had made a discovery about how to sequester sulfur. And so, um, and so, we, so this company was formed, right? So it, it was a lot more complicated than I'm making it sound. I first had to convince my wife that this is something that made sense to do. And we were, <laughs> we were the initial investors, skin in the game, um, uh, full disclosure. And we, this young graduate student, uh, Nathan Ball, who came to my office looking for a job, and in an instant I discovered he wasn't a dishwasher. He was the kind of person who wanted to lead a company, though he'd never done it before. And so Nathan joined us, and we started uh, Gnomes Technologies in 2010. We've, um, so Siobhan had the experience of writing lots of SBIR grants. So we spent a lot of time raising funds from non-diluted uh, sources, building up um, a portfolio of technology without really getting um, venture funding. In 2016, we, um, Solvay and Phoenix uh, Ventures uh, came together, and they are now um, uh, part owners um, of the company. Um, this guy, I think you probably saw his photo before, looking a lot younger and graduated. So Shekhar was the person who actually discovered 
the ionic liquid functionalized gnomes um, 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 particles. He, went, he left my group after his postdoc, went to Intel, and then somehow got an epiphany that he needed to come back. <laughs> so he did, and he is the force behind, um, behind the company. So, um, so I want to not spend too much time on the company because there's some relevance to the, the science that I want to talk about. So companies are interesting for the fact that they get distracted very easily. And Gnomes, in my view, has been distracted for the last seven years with a real and important problem. So we started thinking we were going to solve the lithium dendrite problem in lithium sulfur cells, but the market kept telling the company, yeah, that's not what we want. They, they kept saying, great job with lithium sulfur, but what we want is a better, safer lithium ion technology. And if you can make a lithium metal cell safe, then you should be able to make lithium ion cells safer. So the company has been about solving this problem that you'll see. This is a short generated by a nail in a fully charged lithium ion battery. And so you see the cell first. And this is actually just a 16 amp hour cell. There are thousands of these cells in a typical Tesla Model S. And the challenge isn't that everyone is going to fail in this way. So no gimmicks here. This is a real battery in a real situation. So even if one fails, there's a kind of knock-on effect that makes this a really serious uh, safety hazard. So what uh, Shaker and his team decided to do is to leverage not any of the things I've told you before, but the fact that they had 1,200 ligands to play with on the surface of a particle. And just as Jean-Marie said this morning, the things like the separator gives you degrees of freedom to intervene in a battery that people are only now waking up to. And so the thought here was if I put things in a battery, almost like drugs, to a patient that are able to be released when a catastrophe occurs, it gives me the ability to actually keep them out of the way of the electrochemistry when I don't want them to intervene, and then turn them on when there's an event. And so this is a kind of slow video, and I don't know why I show it except that I like it so much. So this is a, an electrolyte, a norm, oh, da, 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 I got too excited. This is... <laughs> This is this, oh my goodness. Okay, so one more. Okay, so this is the same thing as before, except it has a little bit of this functional ionic liquid, and you'll see almost nothing happens. Some of you might have noticed a bit of smoke, which means that you, ha you have shorted this battery. And if you wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, you will see that it swells, indicating that there is an event that is going on in the battery, but it never achieves thermal runaway. So that's what the company has been distracted doing, figuring out how to bring this solution to existing lithium ion battery markets as a drop in uh, technology solution that deals with safety and also deals with um, high voltage uh, stability. Okay, so, um, so that's the company part, but there's a lot of science to do. Okay, so, um, so, so there's a lot of science to do and we've discovered in the last few years that the problem with the lithium metal electrode is not something to be defensive about because there are many fundamental issues with the lithium metal electrode and they come in um, hydrodynamic forms, mechanical forms, morphological forms, and chemical forms. Okay, so there's a chemical instability that leads to poor reversibility. There's a mechanical, a uh, morphological instability that I will show you leads to mossy deposition and anode volume change. There's a mechanical instability that often comes from the morphological instability, and at high enough current densities, you get this new hydrodynamic stability called electric convection, and all of them work to make the lithium metal electrode not work. So this seems like a very tall uh, challenge. So my group has actually developed programs in each of these areas over the last several years, and I want to talk about what I think is the easiest of these problems, the morphological instability, the chemical instability is hard because it means lithium has to be not lithium, right? It's very reactive. How do you make something not itself? Especially when it sits in a closed system for five, 10 years and you want it to behave you know, as not itself. That's not possible. But, but, but we're showing increasingly it's plausible um, in, in some cases. And the hydrodynamic instability is the other extreme of difficulty because this is really a fundamental consequence of electrokinetics in a system that's polarized. And that, of course, is a battery. So you can't really change it. You can maybe manage it. And this is um, the essence of what we do. So I want to spend a few minutes um, talking about the morphological 
instability, um, just to give you a sense of what we do and how we do it. So, the, um, so recently we proposed this model for how the morphological instability of lithium develops. And so the idea is in the first step, lithium being lithium reacts with any electrolyte that's in contact with it. The reaction produces a passivation layer whose chemistry is unknown and quite complicated, as we recently showed. And this passivation layer, above all else, is heterogeneous. So it forms a coating where the transport properties across the coating vary with space. The end result is that when you reduce lithium at that interface, it reduces in a patchy manner to create these little bumps. Okay? Now the bumps, if you remember your electromagnetics, are, are points of concentration for electric field lines. And just like the lightning rod effect, you know, means that if you go into a thunderstorm with a pointy pole, lightning strikes you. In this case, it's more or less the same thing, that the electric field lines concentrate on the bumps. And this, we believe, is where the uh, mossy or dendritic uh, deposition um, occurs. Now, once this starts, there are other instabilities that are coupled, like the mechanical instability. And here I'm going to show you a video. So one of the tools we use in the group is visualization experiments so we can actually catch these things in the act. And in the example, I'll show you a sodium electrode that is actually going through cycles of plating and stripping. So we're going to begin where it's being stripped. And uh, OK, and so this is the sodium electrode being stripped. And you'll see it's going to be reduced in size. And then, boom, you'll see it releases. And this is called orphaning of the metal. So as you strip it, it basically breaks apart. And you lose the active metal. And if you wait, you will see the cycle changes. So now it's coating, and so the dendrites form. But you'll see that surrounding them are the residue of the things that used to be part of the surface, the orphaned sodium. So the point here is that the morphological instability creates fragility in the structure of deposits, also creates a low density deposit that is very easily lost uh, from the interface. Now, very recently, we showed that these little fluffy things are actually sodium metal. So they are not some reduction product of sodium and the electrolyte. They're actually metallic sodium. And they're lost because of something we call a tip breakage uh, mechanism that releases the sodium um, into the electrolyte. So um, at high current densities, there's another instability. And I'm not going to talk about that. I'm sorry. OK. So how does one attack a problem like this? Right. So I told you that the first step in the process is sodium or lithium being lithium, forming a heterogeneous passivation layer, creating these so-called dendrite nucleates. So, um, so you accept it. You say that's where it is. And the question we had is, could you design the electrolyte using all the tools that you have, the chemistry tools and material science tools, in such a way that these bumps don't grow? Okay. And so the way you do that in chemical engineering science is that you first take a Fourier transform of the surface, and you represent it in terms of its Fourier modes. So this is essentially the interelectrode spacing H that I'm writing in terms of a perturbation growth rate, sigma, which is the rate at which those bumps grow. And I'm also writing it in terms of a, a bump wave number. And the wave number you can think of as a reciprocal of the size of the bumps. Okay. So once I do that, I then write down the governing equations, and that's what these are. And this guy's a mechanical engineer. He just loved this stuff. Okay? So we write down these equations, and we solve the equations for mass conservation along with the equations of mechanics. And in fact, the key contribution we made to this problem is in this red term, where the idea is that when a bump grows, it creates a local pressure on the membrane, right? which is the white uh, species in my example. That pressure basically creates a slight volume change. And that volume change shows up in this term, grad u. That volume change causes a concentration change. And that concentration change basically drives transport. So the idea is that the bump is, in some sense, its own worst enemy. That once it gets created, it pushes ions away from its tip to the valley. And this is actually stabilizing. So this is a very interesting discovery. It added to the formulation that Newman was responsible for, which is captured in the first two terms. In this, in this expression. So out of, after lots of work and lots of um, simulations, you come up with this thing that we call a state diagram that allows you to decide where you can operate using the normal design rules that I mentioned, a battery, and perhaps um, stop dendrites. In other words, they perhaps explain what it is we saw 
with those hairy nanoparticles that led to the formation of the company. So the gist of this plot is that you want to be where it's lighter. So any of the light places is good. That means you're stable. The dark place is not good. And in fact, you can see that the boundary to the dark place is set by two parameters. One, P1, depends on things like the modulus, the transference number, the conductivity, the, the, the current density in the battery. The other one, P2, depends on similar things, except it, it's also controlled by the surface tension. So the message from this plot is that there's a lot of room at the bottom. That in essence, if you're able to operate the battery under conditions where you can limit the nucleate growth sizes below lambda CR, which is set by this number P2, surface tension alone is sufficient to keep the dendrites at bay. So this was an eye-opener for us, OK? So the question was, is, is any of that true? And is any of that um, um, applicable? Well, so we had this thought that, well, if you can bit the nanoparticles, we created these nanoporous materials, but they were formed kind of on the fly by particle self-assembly. So the thought was that if you can like, you know, make them nanostructured by basically cross-linking the hairy nanoparticles in one example, so you fix the space between them, and you could vary the space between them based on the length of the ligands. Or better yet, if you can use something like an anodized alumina, where you can rigorously control the size by the process with which it's made, we can actually test this hypothesis that says that if you can constrain the length scale on which the nucleates form, you can make the dendritic deposition stable. Okay? So, so we did that. And I'm just going to show you some quick results because we don't have a lot of time today. So the first set of results are from the same kind of visualization studies that I showed you a little while ago. But in this case, I'm just showing you still images of lithium deposits for different, um, these are the cross-linked hairy nanoparticles, different nanoparticle spacings. And so these, again, are tortuous structures. And so this is like an average pore spacing, but a pore structure is to be understood, to be complicated. And so this is where you have particles that are micron apart, relatively far apart. Here is where they're about half that distance, 500 nanometers and 100 nanometers. And here we're observing the interface they form in a liquid electrolyte as a function of time or the amount of capacity, right? So 8 milliampere hours corresponds roughly to 40 microns of lithium that has been deposited, okay? And so what you ought to notice is that when we got from 500 to 100, something changed, that the material seemed to deposit in much more um, uh, planar, well-controlled uh, morphologies. We can measure the growth rate of the um, interface, and that's shown here. So this is the highest pore size. This is the next highest, and this is the smallest pore size. So you can see the growth rate is also reduced. As a consequence, we can actually do modeling and compare the results to the model. And the, they don't agree, but they agree, except, uh, they agree qualitatively. Uh, I should say they don't agree quantitatively, but they agree qualitatively, namely that when you get to some critical pore size of order um, half a micron, in this case, you get this kind of flattening in the growth rate. Okay. OK, so, um, so we can do the same thing with the AAO to remove the effect of mechanics. And that's what this slide shows you. So if we use a 20 nanometer pore AAO, we study the red is basically a liquid electrolyte that's not in the nanoporous medium. It's basically in a conventional cell guard separator. And you can see, again, by this sort of plate strip test where we monitor the voltage versus time, that a cell shorts in a relatively short time. The voltage drops, as you can see from this point. Whereas for the other cells, the cell cycle, and if we increase the current density, and in fact, this is about the highest. Um, we typically will go in a lithium ion battery um, today. The cell cycle for hundreds, thousands of hours without any evidence of shorts um, being formed. We can do a, a similar experiment where we fix the current density and change the pore size, which is what I'm doing here. And you'll see at 20, things are well behaved. At 50, they're more or less well behaved. At 100, things become a little bit choppy, but by 300, they're pretty bad. So indicating there is a turn on to this behavior where the um, dendrites can actually perhaps short the cell producing this, um, this unique voltage profile. And that turn on happens somewhere in, in, from our perspective between uh, 100 and maybe 300 or so uh, nanometers, which is again you know, roughly what we expect theoretically for the, um, the, 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 the properties uh, in the electrolyte. Okay, so I'm going to just 
I, I know time is limited, so I'm going to just... Um, so we've had lots of fun, including some work with Jeff Coates, where we've shown that this behavior is not restricted to AAO or cross-linked uh, particles, but in fact, even cross-linked polymers, if you design them well. And obviously, you can make this on a much larger scale. These are polyethylenes that have PEO as a cross-linker. They show among the best performance to date in this regard, indicating this, the physics are probably, um, probably right. So um, I see Young getting up. Is that, does that mean I'm done? OK, all right. <laughs> so, so just quickly, um, the, the same concepts could be used on interfaces. And so we've developed methods for putting coatings of crosslink particles. We've developed this very elegant method known as langmuir blodgett scooping that allows you to basically use Marangoni um, stresses to create ordered arrays of nanostructures on the surface of copper. And then we can use this very simple transfer process in a glove box to put those particle-based interfaces on the surface of lithium metal. We can do cycling studies. And these are some of the most recent results, where what I'm showing you are lithium metal batteries, where we're cycling a lithium metal electrode against the NCM811 cathode. And we're going from very high so-called n to p ratios, which is excesses of lithium, to one-to-one -one entropy ratios. And as you can see, I mean, these aren't perfect. But as you can see, we're getting pretty reasonable levels of reversibility in these cells. So, so it's not to declare victory, but to say that um, we stumbled on this idea that these hairy nanostructures gives us a degree of freedom we didn't have. And with the help of theory, we've now understood why and how they work. And we're taking advantage of these things to build um, lithium metal batteries, and we think if this is good, then it should work for zinc and some of the other metals that might give even lower cost uh, solutions. So thank you for your time. And any questions, perhaps? We have like five minutes. Due to the time, let's have one or two questions. Oh, yes, yeah, John. But I think, you know, the way of putting inorganic nanoparticles on the separator is commercially done today. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Correct, correct. Because if I can keep going, the more as Jeff Dan has been shown what the effect of pressure Yes. the Dan Rigo. Yes, yes. You may comment on this topic. I don't remember it was beneficial or detrimental. Yeah, yeah. So the um, so so pressure is in that kind of analysis. So this is actually the first analysis of Newman. So there's a sort of static pressure. And that pressure changes the kinetics of the deposition. In fact, it reduces the rate at which lithium deposits. So that is already built in. And the effect that is new is actually not the pressure per se, but the pressure variations in space that is induced when the bump interacts with the interface. But you are right that the, um, the battery companies are, in fact, already uh, not putting uh, particles on separators for this purpose. I think they will say it's for safety. This is what the argument they've made to me, that they can go to thinner separators and the particles provides just hardness. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, yeah. Yes, Chris. So with, uh, with the addition of the hearing nanoparticles, what then is the effect on the end cost of a battery that's being That's a great question. And so which one, though? So lithium-ion batteries are right now at cutthroat prices. And so if you were paying close attention, what you would see is that the gnomes, um, the company, they're not putting hearing nanoparticles in their batteries. They've discovered a molecular solution that is a whole lot lighter weight and um, a more, cost, more cost effective. But why we like the, the hairy particles is they give you a way of actually studying things fundamentally. And then the thought is, OK, then how do we make it a commercial success by scaling? Good question. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Polymer, and in this case, and ceramic. Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh no, I love it. Yeah, in fact, just I just had a nice conversation yesterday with someone who tells me there might even be a third way. Someone who knows how to make ceramics that look like polymers in terms of their mechanics. And so my perspective is that where the polymer helps is that it's more compliant to the interfaces. And so in particular, systems where we have to use an intercalating cathode 
you, you, you cannot use a solid state ceramic. I would make that prediction now. You need something more compliant, perhaps a little bit of liquid, but I think a polymer would be the best way to a solid state. So a hybrid in that sense, where it's more like a sandwich. Okay, let's thank our <laughs>